Hello everybody, I'm finally back with a new Genshin Impact Theory video. I decided to split the new quests from version 3.6 into two videos because I'm still kinda burned from editing a 40 minutes video and I'm trying not to do something like that for a very long time. Today we're talking about Sapientia Oromastis Act 2, Homecoming, so everything about a pet, basically. Well, next week we're talking about Hverina of Good and Evil, so everything that has to do with the Girl of the Sands. Of course, if you haven't played the quests, you might want to leave because this will spoiler it for you. As always, this is a theory video. I use information available in the game, but my theories and deductions are also based on my own personal research and interpretation, so they're not to be considered the official lore of the game, unless I got something right and it's confirmed in later updates of the game itself. With that being said, before the main topic of this video, let's check out a few things from my past videos that I actually got right. First of all, I've always said that King Deshret's Arsketia name was going to be Amun, since he is the only Egyptian god that was included in the Arsketia and Nahida did confirm that by calling him Amun al-Ahmar. Then, and this is something that we're gonna talk about in my next video, the original Hydro Archon did die during the Cataclysm like I thought. We know that because Zurvan, the first party who was born during the Cataclysm, told us that the Oceanids travelled to the Vorukasha Oasis because they were attracted by the original Hydro Archon's power, the Amrita Pool, meaning that the Oceanids fled from Fontaine not long after the Cataclysm, and we also know this in great detail from the new artifact set Vorukasha's Glow, in which we learn that the original Hydro Archon remains are the Amrita pool, but like I said before, this is next week's topic. Alright, with that out of the way, let's start the video with a very quick recap of Nahida's story quest. We met Nahida who found a strange and unknown device with a very similar elemental power as hers. We then found a fainted fungus that turned out to be an elemental being, one that even Nahida had never seen or heard of before. It came from an ancient race, as ancient as Tevat, that had to flee from their homeland because of the apocalypse, forbidden knowledge, and transformed into fungi. Because they were corrupted by forbidden knowledge, when Nahida erased it, they were left with a void and they lost some of their memories, like where and what their homeland was. It also told us about a prophecy according to which the Dendra Archon would have led them back to their homeland once the apocalypse was over. We learned that the tumors of the withering are elemental beings that died because of the void caused by the Immersal change, and another fungus elemental being later told us that the homeland is the world inside the Danger Dragon Apep, an elemental dragon like Dvalin, only way older, that nurtured the early life forms at the very beginning of Tvat. She has been ruling over Sumeru ever since it was still a lush rainforest, so before the Celestial Nail was sent down. Because it's the most adaptable life form of the world, forbidden knowledge should have become part of her and because of the Airman's soul change, she may die, causing worldwide catastrophic consequences, but no one knows where she is since she disappeared right after the Shred's death. According to the prophecy from before, another elemental being decided to preserve the apocalypse and went to the chasm, where it stabilized forbidden knowledge, turning it into oozing filth thanks to the power of the Celestial Nail, which was a tool used in ancient times to fight the abyss and repair the rifts of the vat. Thanks to the power of the Dendro Archon, the elemental being was able to survive for centuries and, because it preserved forbidden knowledge, it retained its memories despite the Hermosal change, since its purpose was to remind the Archon what she knew she would have forgotten. The Dentro Crystal, the Fire Seed, mimics the heart of Oasis, a Pep's power source, so it can heal her, but it's also used to actually find her. We then met Sharon, um, sorry, a Pep in the desert, we fought corrupted elemental beings, the Hydro Fungus evolved into a grounded Hydro Shroom because we didn't get enough Pokemon references back during the Fabulous Fungus Frenzy, and then Nahida managed to convince a Pep, so we ended up in the homeland, where the Fire Seed shattered because Nahida overused it. Nahida then decided to sacrifice her power to become a fire seed, reverting back into a twig, her original form, but she was stopped by the elemental beings who sacrificed themselves to cure Apep. Once cured, Apep was finally at peace and opened the dialogue. She told us that in the past, the Dragon King Nibelung acquired the power of darkness from outside the vat, so forbidden knowledge, to defeat the outsiders, the heavenly principles. This sparked a catastrophic war that brought Nibelung's demise, but also devastation all over the vat. The winners, Celestia, shaped the world as they saw fit, but Apep kept gathering forbidden knowledge all over the collapsing Tvat to keep fighting, but she was stopped by one of the Celestial Nails, the one that fell on Mount Damavand. Apep slumbered until Amun al Ahmar, King the Shred, obtained forbidden knowledge thanks to Nabu Malikata, the Lord of Flowers, and decided to establish his kingdom in Apep's territory. 
Because she still didn't give up on the fight against the outsiders, she accepted under the condition that, upon the Shred's death, she would have obtained his whole knowledge. At this point, the Dragon King Nibelung returned, but the world and the dragons had changed. Some of them accepted the new order, some died, while others fled. Only Apep never gave up on the Dragon King's mission. When the Shred died, the agreement was fulfilled, but Apep was unaware that she would have obtained more forbidden knowledge that she could handle. She spent all her strength to keep the pain under control, and she was left with no energy to analyze the forbidden knowledge, which corrupted her, hence the apocalypse. Okay, now that the recap is over, let's talk for a second about something that we've already talked about many times in my past videos, something that will, once again, create a lot of turmoil in the comment section. Ruka Devata wasn't erased from existence, only from the memories of the people. We've seen before, and it should have been very clear by now, that Ermansol has power only over memories and knowledge, the data that compiled Tvat. It is unable to radically change the past, it can only change the perception of it, which is something that Ruka Devata herself as well as Kusanali and Skarmouche clearly stated. The problem came with the books that also change, which are physical objects, but since Ermansol erased Rukadevata also from the memories of the people of the past, they couldn't have written about her, but I admit that this concept is hard to accept. If Rukadevata had been erased from existence and not just from memories, even the Traveler wouldn't have remembered her, and Nahida's body would have been that of an adult. I mean, even Rukadevata said that Kusanali is just 500 years old because of her appearance. Furthermore, Nahida also said that she has a vague feeling that she has experienced the pain of loss in the past, and that she felt a warmth that once supported her. Her analogy was just perfect, by the way. I would say I can no longer see words on a piece of paper after they have been erased, but I can still see the slight indentations of where the words had been written. Lastly, Rukadavata's name is still written on one of the seats in the Garden of Paradisa, which is detached from Ermansol, so it didn't change. With this new story quest, we got some more proof, so let's talk about it. The Fire Seed is composed of a Dendro power almost identical to Kusanali's, but slightly different. Considering that both Kusanali and Rukadavata are two iterations of the same being, their power is the same, but also slightly different since they are, in the end, different people. The Fire Seed was created by Rukadavata, that's why Kusanali couldn't completely make sense of it. Then the grounded Geoshroom most likely thought that it was talking to Rukadavata, the only Dendro Archon he has ever known. Rukadevata already planned to have someone erase her from Ermansol, and she knew that the memories about the Pharisee and Apep were going to be erased as well. That's why she made sure that the Geo Shroom survived as long as it could, preserving forbidden knowledge and the memories connected to it by stabilizing them thanks to the Celestial Nail. This means that Ermansol didn't change the Geo Shroom's memories, as a consequence, the Geo Shroom thought it was talking to Rukadevata. It also asked the Archon, Did you get smaller again? As we saw in the cutscene, Ruka Devata had enough time since the Shred's fall to replenish her power and grow her body back into that of an adult, meaning that the agreement with the Geo Shroom was made around the time of the Cataclysm, when she already planned her sacrifice and Kusanali's birth and purpose. Nahida also told us that if she reverted back to a twig, it would have taken a long time to grow her body back. This means that she's actually 500 years old, otherwise she would look like an adult, hence the Geoshroom surprise. But you probably heard the Geoshroom's memories when it sacrificed itself. We heard it thanking the Dentro Archon for protecting it with her elemental power and saying goodbye to her, but we weren't able to hear her reply. That was obviously Ruka Devata speaking, and since those memories are not supposed to exist anymore, we couldn't hear them. Still, she told him that it would meet Nahida in the future. That's why it said that it promised it would wait for her, no matter how long it takes. Now, when we healed the fungus, it was probably confused after centuries stuck in forbidden knowledge, so I thought that the Archon in front of him was Ruka Devata at first. Even the Hydrofungus said that it most likely lost its mind after so long. Now I'm eagerly waiting to read the comment section after this. I already know what's gonna happen and I just can't wait for it. I have to warn you though, I am completely sure about this theory about Ruka Devata and Ermansol. There's no chance in my mind that it can be wrong, so good luck if you'll try to change my mind. Now, moving on. What about Apep and Nibelung in our mythology? Apep or Apophis was an Egyptian deity that represented chaos. 
It was depicted as a giant serpent, but it was also called the evil dragon. And it was the moral enemy of Ra, the sun god. They basically fought every day, or every night actually, and the people prayed so that Ra could win and as a consequence the sun would rise. Considering that the god Ra was later merged with the god Amun, becoming Amun-Ra, it makes sense that the writer chose this name since she had a connection to King Shred, Amun al Ahmar. Nibelung, on the other hand, is not so straightforward. It could refer to the Nibelungen Lied, a German epic poem from the 13th century about the heroic legends of Prince Siegfried, but it could also refer to the king and inhabitants of a mythical land of dwarfs and giants, but also about Wagner's Der Ring des Nibelungen. One interesting aspect of this opera is that it's composed of four parts. Das Rheingold, which is a short prelude, and I don't think that I need to remind you about Rhine Daughter, aka Gold. Die Valkyrie, die Valkyrie, Siegfried and Goethe Dämmerung, the Twilight of the Gods. The story follows the struggles of gods, heroes and mythical creatures over a magic ring that grants domination over the whole world. You know, one ring to rule them all. And ends with a final cataclysm. Ignoring the Lord of the Rings, does that remind you of something, or maybe multiple games at once? Oh, and by the way, one of the Nibelungs from this opera is called Albrecht. Anyway, moving on, let's talk about Apep, or better yet, about the elemental dragons. We know from before Sun and Moon that the world the Primordial One came back to was ruled by seven dragon lords of the old world that were defeated by the Primordial One. We then know that the elements of these dragons, for whatever reasons, were earth, water, fire, wind, ether and void, according to Orobashi's experimental records of the Bathysmal bishops, so only six elements instead of seven. We also know from multiple sources that a new generation of these dragon sovereigns has been appearing in Tvat. One of them is Tvalin, the animal dragon. He was born, according to the book Breeze Amidst the Forest and the narrator should be Venti, either back during the Envoy Age or not long after Barbados defeated the Caribbean. Here's my doubt. The book says that he was born when the gods walked among us in their prime, which sounds like the early days of Barbados after he defeated the Caribbean. The problem is actually the fact that it's Venti narrating the story, so it wouldn't surprise me if he used a generic description of the time that can be understood according to the reader's knowledge. The people of Tevat don't really know anything before the current gods walk the earth, but we do. I think he's referring to the Envoy Age, the time when the gods and their envoys walked among the humans, like it's said multiple times in the tiaras of Torrents, Flame and Thunder, and like it's depicted on both Dragonspine and Surumi Island's murals. Another dragon may or may not be Ashdaha, but I believe he is. He had been slumbering for millennia before Morax found him, and he is older than the mountains themselves, but above all, he is an elemental being, so it kinda makes sense that he's one of the dragon lords, or at least of the new generation of them. I've seen online the meme about Venti, John Lee and Nahida having a dragon while the Shogun doesn't, which is really funny by the way, but is that true? I'm obviously not talking about Orobashi, but do you remember the prophecy that he found in Ankanomiya about the Hydro Dragon? This dragon is supposed to be reborn in the form of a human, which I dare say it already has and we already met it, Tsumi. I'm not gonna talk about her in this video, otherwise this is definitely becoming a 40 minutes video again, but you know, food for thoughts. Okay, let's get to the point. Apep said that some dragons got close to the gods, like the Valin and Ashdaha. Some fled while others died, so maybe we won't get to meet all seven of them. Going back to the elements in the experimental records, the Valin is the wind dragon, Ashdaha is the earth dragon, the hydro one is the water dragon, and Apep out of exclusion should be the ether dragon, so the only two missing dragons are fire and void, and the latter should either be cryo or electro at this point. Apep also said that there is a dragon king, Nibelung, who died and millennia later returned. Considering that we know only six elements for seven dragons, I guess Nibelung's element may be unknown in Tevat, like, I don't know, the light element that seems to belong to the Traveler, maybe? Now let's get to the reason it took me a long time to make this video. Apep's story. 
Apep told us that she hates the usurper from beyond the heavens and then that they fought against the outsiders, which caused a devastating war that almost destroyed Tavat. This destruction lasted until the Envoy Age, when the Celestial Nails were sent down all over Tavat. Apep also said that she hates the gods, the heavenly principles, but also the humans, because they all sold the dragon's lands. Lastly, we also know that Apep nurtured the early life forms. Now, you can probably guess why this is very confusing to me. I came up with one decent explanation that somehow makes sense, at least for the most part. The seven dragons didn't completely die because of the fight with the Primordial One, which is the usurper from beyond the heavens, and they ended up in the microcosm of Tavat where Apep nurtured the early life forms before the humans left the Ark. The dragons were most likely reborn in Tavat right after the loss of the Primordial One, retaining their memories. Later, the second throne, the Outsiders, so Celestia, arrived and fought with the Primordial One, but also with the dragons. The Dragon King Nibelun gathered forbidden knowledge from outside Vat to defeat these Outsiders, but they eventually won, vanquishing Nibelun and maybe every other dragon except for a pet. The heavens collapsed, the earth was rent asunder, the back capsized, so it was on the verge of collapse, which is the devastation Apep talks about. Later, when humans started reappearing on the world, it's what I call the Envoy Age. Apep kept looking for and gathering forbidden knowledge to fight Celestia, but she was stopped by one of the celestial nails that were sent down to mend the place and close the rifts that were leaking the abyssal power in the inhabitable plane of Tvat. And we know that this happened in the Envoy Age because Kapatsir saw multiple spikes coming down from the sky at the same time, one of which hit Suromi Island where she nested, causing the fog, and one hit Salvindak near Dragonspine, causing the ice. Now, let me explain why I came to this conclusion. Apep and Nibelung were actively looking for forbidden knowledge and they were capable of understanding it, which means that they were not originally born in Tavat, they came from outside, from the old world. But the fact that Apep's forbidden knowledge was removed from her could mean that Apep is affected by Ermansoul, so she has to have been reborn in Tevat right after its creation, or that the dragons were recreated by the Primordial One. You know, like Ren's daughter also created a dragon while trying to create a Primordial Human. If that wasn't the case, Apep would have been unaffected by Ermansoul just like the Traveler. Although I have to say that the Traveler never actually touched the Forbidden Knowledge, and we don't really know how that works, so there is a slight chance that the original dragons never actually died against the Primordial One. They probably died when they fought against the second who came, and only Apep survived. But that's a dilemma that I honestly can't solve. My second reason is that in Before Sun and Moon, it is said that the land and waters that the Primordial One created accepted those who rebelled and those who would not kneel, which is a whole chapter before the humans left the Ark. Maybe the ancestors who made the covenant with the Primordial One were the dragons who later fought alongside it against the second who came, and the early life forms that Apep nurtured were the Primordial Humans and or the Sealy race. The next reason is actually the fact that Apep hates the humans because they stole her land. I believe them to be the modern humans, not the primordial ones, basically those who accepted the gods of the new owner. Anyway, this further proves that she had to have lived in Tavat before these humans arrived. When it comes to the other dragons though, there is another problem. Apep said that some of them grew close to the new order and forgot what had been done to them. Some died and some fled and we know that at least Valin was born in Tvat, which means that he belongs to the second generation of dragon sovereigns. And he grew close to one of the new gods. This also applies to Ashdaha, minus his mind giving up because of erosion. The Hydro Dragon is also a member of the second generation because it will be reborn in Enkanomiya with a human form. Differently from Dvalin and Ashdaha, this water dragon may be either the one who fled or the one who died, or potentially both. The fact that it will appear in Ekonomia and not in Tavat sounds like it took refuge in the oceans just like the bishops, and the fact that it will be reborn means that it has to have died. Crazy theory of the day would be that maybe Ekonomia managed to survive because the water dragon swallowed it as it was fleeing the war. I mean, Apep has a whole war inside of her, so it can make sense that the War of Dragon was kinda similar. Because I believe Enkanomiya to be in the Abyss, since it borders with all three realms, 
If the dragon tried to flee, it had to go through the abyss. But since the power of the Void Realm is toxic to the inhabitants of the Light Realm, it may have died. Again, this is just the crazy theory of the day, let's remember that. Lastly, a pep complaining about the dragons giving up on Nibelung's fight can only make sense if the new generation of dragons retain their original memories. Which can actually make sense since they would have died in Tevat, so their memories would have gone into the ley lines, and we know that Ashdaha used them to sustain himself, and that he lost his mind because the people from Liyue overmined the chasm, hurting the ley lines in the process. The dragons retaining their memories can also make sense considering the fact that Nibelung was reborn but he found a completely new world where no dragon, except for a pep, was fighting his fight anymore. And that's it, I hope you liked the video. If you did like the video don't forget to leave a thumbs up and if you enjoy Genshin Impact Theory videos consider subscribing. I am really looking forward to your theories in the comment section because this time my theories are very circumstantial. I still feel like there's a missing piece somewhere that would make this whole story make completely sense, but I can't seem to find it still. Anyway, next week's video is gonna be all about the Girl of Sand, the unpronounceable names and Karya, as you can see by the gate behind me. Now that I think about it, this is the first time I've ever ended a video in a different place than the beginning. Anyway, I'll start working on the script right away because there is a lot to understand and figure out, so there is a chance it'll take longer than expected. Well then, thanks for watching and until next time, over and out.